You can all relax a little bit because I don't have anything really profound or challenging or difficult that you have to do after this talk. It's actually going to be really easy. But I want to tell you a story today. It's a story I know well, probably the only story that I know well, and that's because it's mine. It's not really about me. I'm a character in it. It's a little bit about you, but it's mostly about somebody that you love. So I guess I want to start in middle school. As you can tell from my accent, I'm French Canadian, raised in Wisconsin. <laughs> and when I was 12, I went to my mom and I asked her for something ridiculous. I asked her if I could spend $200 of money I had earned on my own as a young entrepreneur. I wanted to buy a specific list of items. I needed a melting pot, three pounds of lead, some wire, a couple colors of silicone rubber, a couple shades of paint, and a few tools. I wasn't interested in making bombs. I wanted to make fishing lures. I love to fish. Always have. But in my crazy little brain, I really thought that I had some ideas and that I could make fishing lures that were better than I could buy at the store. Crazy as a 12-year-old to think something so obnoxious. But I learned some things about fishing, and I th really thought I could do it. And instead of my mom saying, little boys don't play with molten lead and sharp objects, you're probably going to permanently disfigure yourself. <laughs> instead, she gave me this. And I started making fishing lures. And they worked really well. So I started giving them to my friends, who then shared them with their dads. And then people started buying them. And the amateurs and professionals started using these things that I made with my own hands, winning fishing tournaments and winning thousands of dollars. So as a young entrepreneur, the next thing I do, of course, retail. <laughs> so as a 12-year-old, I started stocking fishing stores with stuff I was making after school. Pretty cool learned a lot about myself and a lot about life. Well, like most things in my life, and you're going to see as the story progresses, I kind of go turbo for a little while, and then I want to do something else. So after about two years of that, I wanted to do something else. I was watching TV, and I saw a man sprint across the screen, go 20 feet in the air, clear a crossbar. He did it on a pole that was an inch and a half wide and it blew my freaking mind. <laughs> and I said, I have to do that. So I went to my math teacher at school, who was also the track coach, and I asked him for something ridiculous. I said, Coach Bell, I want to be the pole vaulter for the track team. He kind of snickered, and he knew it was ridiculous because we didn't have any pole vaulters on the track team. We never had pole vaulters on the track team. There wasn't a single person at school that knew how to teach or coach pole vault, and we didn't have a mat to practice on. And instead of saying, this is foolish, you're probably going to permanently disfigure yourself, he gave me this. And he said, there's an old pole in the field house. I don't know where it came from. It's been here ever since I got a job here. You can use it. So I went to the field house and blew the dust off, and I saw where somebody had etched on it 160LB. And I knew that meant it was for somebody who weighed 160 pounds. I've never weighed 160 pounds. <laughs> At that time, I weighed about 116 pounds if I had on three pairs of clothes and they were all wet. But he said, if you can make it to the region meet by the end of the year on that pole, we'll get the one you need. He bought that pole the next year. <laughs> then he said, if you make it in place in the state meet, we'll get you a mat. He bought that mat the next year. After he got the mat, he said, hey, dude, I got to tell you something. I really need you to train two other kids how to do this, because if the school finds out I spent four grand on you, <laughs> I'm in trouble. So fast forward a few more years and a few more ridiculous projects, some of which were real successes and some of which I fell on my face and totally bombed. That's OK. I graduate high school and move on to college. 
And I started out at one school and learned how to study for the first time. I was always the kid who got in trouble for talking, for not paying attention, for not staying in your seat, for being disruptive. John just told me that was okay. I heard that. <laughs> and so I learned how to study for the first time, and that was because I could start choosing what I wanted to learn. So made the, whatever, president's list or honor roll, whatever it was, something great that first year, and started looking like a real student. And I decided to transfer colleges, not to pursue academic excellence, but to chase a young woman who I'd fallen in love with. Some of you snickers, she's sitting right there. <laughs> We've been married 13 years and have four boys. But when I got to that school, I had a real problem, because now it was time to pick a major and to broadcast to the world, what do you want to do with your life? That's a problem, because I didn't know. So I decided I wanted to keep my options open. I talked to the guidance counselor and she said, well, you've got to pick something. And I said, well, I'll, I think I want to do a lot of things. But one of the options I want to keep open is the possibility of being a dentist. <laughs> I don't have a love for teeth. <laughs> I don't have an affinity for oral bacteria. <laughs> but there was one man in my life, the greatest man in my life, my dad. And that's what he did. And I said, let's at least keep that option open because I know that works. He made it to all my baseball games, did all the family stuff. That looks good. The guidance counselor said, okay, great. Pre-dental major, you need to be biology or chemistry. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I hate biology and I hate chemistry. I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. She said, well, you're going to have to have so many classes that you've got to be one of those anyway. And I said, no, I'll be a business major. I'll take all the other stuff I need on the side to get into dental school. She said, you're going to have to have a science minor. This is not an easy thing. You're going to have to go every summer, blah, blah, blah. And I said, OK, just sign me up. She gave me this. I started classes. The plan was beautiful. I could do what I wanted to do and what I needed to do. But see, I parked on this side of the campus. And over here was the business and the chemistry and the biology building. But the thing I hadn't taken into account that almost messed up the whole plan was right in the middle of where I parked and where I went every day was the art department. <laughs> <laughs> so on my walk every day, I would hear this uh, amazing noise, the roar of furnaces burning, 2,200 degree propane. I would hear metal clanking, students yelling, and I'd peek in to the glass blowing studio. <laughs> students dripping sweat making gorgeous things on the end of a four-foot-long pole, and they couldn't even touch it with their own hands. And I knew I had to do it. <laughs> it obsessed me. It's all I could think about. I stopped in to talk to the professor and said, I want to take this class. I found a very gruff, very intimidating man who used words that I had never heard in my life. And he let me know that the class was for art majors. I said, no problem, man. I'll change my major. He said, no, I mean real art majors. And even if you were a real art major, there's a two-year waiting list for this class. I told him I understood, and I went on to my marketing class. I stopped by that studio no less than 40 times that semester just to hang out. And you know what happened? We became friends. I asked questions that let Ralph Harvey, the professor, know that I was obsessed and that I was studying and that I was listening. He stopped me at the end of the semester and he said, Nate, I want to give you something. There it is again. <laughs> he said, next semester starts in two weeks and you're in the class. P.S. I really need you to be good because a lot of art majors are going to hate you if you aren't. 
So now I'm a student. I'm a business major with a science minor. I'm now making a living out of the art department, selling in high-end art galleries, art shows, doing commissions for restaurants and hotel chains. It's working. And I get to be a businessman and an artist. I had two real jobs, one of which was a UPS store because I needed the discount packing materials to be able to run my online business shipping goods. <laughs> the other was I was the manager of a little health club because I needed the free membership because I had also, in my spare time, become a competitive power lifter. I was an officer in two student organizations. I was everywhere, doing everything, and it felt great. My scholarship was running out because I had taken way too many classes. I didn't want to pay for college because it's expensive. <laughs> so I managed to negotiate being the editor of the school paper and reviving it. It had been dead for two years in exchange for another full ride scholarship. So we did that. Why do I tell you all this stuff? It's not boasting. In my life, I've realized now, fast forward several years, several businesses, several children, all the stuff. I've realized when I'm not acting that way, I'm really unhappy. When I'm not in my zone, I'm unfulfilled. And that's because the person that I am is busy and creative. And I like to get my hands on stuff. I'm a doer. If all I did were teeth all day, I would go crazy. And that's kind of what I want to talk about with all of this, is that everybody has a certain design. We all have these things, these things that pull us. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. You can discern on your own. But we must do them. Half of our adult population is dissatisfied with their own life, and I have a theory on that. It's because they're not living to their design and their potential. And if you know you're wasting, you feel bad about it. And then you get angry. You think Genevieve has a pull for women? She can't not do that. She must do that. I believe that a higher power designs us. Some of you may not agree, and that's fine. But that's good for me to believe, because then I feel obligated to be good at it. So if figuring out who we are and what our design is matters, if we need to learn, how do we do that? There's a million ways to learn, right? You can read a book. You can watch TED Talks. You can go to a seminar. But what's the best way to learn? We all know, experience. I heard of a study not too long ago. They were uh, interviewing or, or, or surveying uh, surgical residents who were just about to be released to the world to start performing surgery. And they asked the residents, would you rather be worked on by a new graduate resident, someone just like you, or someone who's been practicing 15 years that's intoxicated. I don't know what the real stats are. You know, like 87.4% of stats are made up on the spot. <laughs> but it was like 90% of them said, I want the drunk lady to do me. <laughs> because experience matters. So if there's value in discovering self, if we have to learn where that is, if we know experience, is the best way to get there, then what do we have to do now? See, there's this little voice that sits on your shoulder called resistance. And that little voice is always saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You're not smart enough to do that. You're not qualified to do that. What's, your, what's he going to think? Stephen Pressfield, in an awesome book called uh, The War of Art, he takes it a step further and he says, resistance is not just a common stumbling block that we all have and something we have to get over is actually evil. 
It's not a spiritual book, but he defines it as evil because it actually strips you of who you are and prevents you from being who you should be, which I agree with. So how do we defeat resist resistance? That's where this comes in. I know you want to know what's in here. <laughs> and I'm going to show you. I've had the privilege of several people giving me this in my life. And that very gesture is what made me discover who I am and make me be useful for the world. This is it. This is what you need, isn't it? Anybody? Do you need this? I would love to be able to give it to you, but it's really cheap coming from me. I'm a nobody. Some of you will still take today and use it. Because this is the only way to learn. We have to start. And the experience has to begin. It's the only way. But when I said at the beginning this isn't necessarily about you, it's about somebody you love. Somebody in your life. need you to give them this so they can figure out who they are. Can you tell I'm serious? I joke because I'm uncomfortable. This is serious stuff. So I want to commission you with a challenge, and that is to take it, if you can, from somebody like me and use it yourself. But beyond that, give it over and over and over to the people around you that are crying out to you, asking for it. Thank you.